No, it was not. Actually, that story is about you and me also in there. In the news this week, there's a couple of interesting things. We could talk about all the politics that are going on, but that would take us more than an hour, and you guys don't want to be here four or five hours, do you, in just politics. Russia hits at reclaiming Cuba, Vietnam bases and tests for U.S. We ever stop and think about how close the end times are coming and we don't realize that every day prophecy is being fulfilled around us. You know, you don't realize it, but we are in those times that the, the book of Revelations and Daniel and all those talked about. And here's an example the Cold War starting to come back again, where they're looking at it. The threat of Russia coming back into Cuba again is just a near possibility. The Sanhedrin rules prophesied return of Jews to Israel has been fulfilled. One of the things we know about in the end times is that the, the Jewish temple system has to be restarted again. And as we've been watching the last couple of years, we see the whole process coming into one of the things, a part of the Jubilee, if you look down there, it says, the Jewish people are about to restore and commemorate an ordinance that has been dormant for about 2,000 years, almost as far back as the days when Jesus Christ walked the earth. This New Year's celebration, or Rosh Hashanah, Hashanah will include the re re recitation of the Jubilee year counting Miz, mitzvah or biblical commandment. There are five mitzvah connected to the Jubilee. Counting the Jubilee, letting free slaves, returning land, blowing the shofar, and forgiving debts. Rabbi Weiss explained, we have instituted one, the counting of the Jubilee. Now well, this is an important thing because it tells us that the Jewish system they're trying to get restarted back up again, and this is it. Does anybody remember when the year of Jubilee ends? Last week. Yeah, I think it was last week. It says when Rosh Hashanah, well, I can't get that one. Stan, tell me how to say that right. There you go. The Jewish New Year ends on the evening of Tuesday, the 4th of October. It will be time for Jews to count the second year of the Jubilee cycle. The blessings and the counts are as follows. Blessed are thou, Lord, our God, King of the universe, who sanctifies us in his commandments and has commanded us to count the Sabbaths and the Jubilees. So you don't realize how close the, the temple system is being put together. I mean, the day that they say they can build that temple, they will build it. I mean, they got everything ready to go, and the systems are all being put. All the ritual systems are all coming back into play, as we see now. Net yet to religious freedom, Putin's Russia cracks down. Have you been keeping track of what the new law is in Russia? It's called the Yar Yarovaya Law which purports to be a counterterrorism and public safety measure, prohibits religious gatherings in unregistered places, restricts promoting religion on the Internet, and makes it easier for Russian officials to deny, in, to deny entry into and departure from the country. And since the Yarvana law places severe restrictions on evangelism for prosthesizing as the Russian government sees it, it's not our, hard to see how a Baptist missionary might get into trouble. Now the Baptist missionary was going around and presenting the gospel to others and he got fined. And uh, he got fined about $800 and now he had a choice of whether or not he wanted to pay that or not. The law defines missionary work as the activity of a religious association aimed at disseminating information about its beliefs among people who are not participants. You notice how it puts that? People who are not participants or members or followers in that religious association with the purpose of involving these people as participants, members, or followers. In other words, they're trying to bring them to Christ, aren't they? 
Activity that falls under this definition may only be performed without hindrance or designate, at designated churches and other religious sites. And it is expressly forbidden to perform missionary activities in private residence. And right now, the police are going around to these home churches that are, and they're telling them to disband. Otherwise, we're going to come in and disband you. And they're, it's happening all over Russia right now. It's going in. Now, this missionary was told, you better pay the fine from his lawyer. You know what he told him? He wasn't going to pay the fine. He said no. So now the question is, what are they going to do with him because he's refusing to obey that law? So we'll get to hear more about that, I'm sure, as time goes on. But we don't realize how close prophecy is coming together around us every day. We think of this and we look at this and we go, well, ha, it's just another incident. But no, Revelation tells us this is what's going to be happening as it prepares for that time. Two weeks ago, we talked about God's the creator. We learned that he is capable of doing anything. Last week, we learned God is holy. And through that process, we learned that Isaiah said, here am I, send me, when he realized the holiness of God. And of course, he used an exclamation mark that we talked about there that means excitement. He's looking forward to doing that. And that's the way we should be. And this today, I want to get into looking at God is just. Now, when we looked at our scripture reading, we tend to think that that is a rich man's problem that we just read about. But have you ever stopped and thought that's not a rich man's problem? They may have used the rich man as the example, but there is four mistakes that we saw that that person did. It's the same four mistakes we see people do all the time around us. Now, it doesn't have to be a rich man who claims they don't want to give up their possessions. It doesn't have to be a rich man who says, calls him not Lord. All these things are things that we see happen today among people around us all the time. So let's look at this. Who is Jesus according to other religions? Now, if you remember in the story of the rich man, what did he call Jesus? He called him rabbi or a good teacher, right? Not once did he recognize him as Lord. A big difference between a teacher and a Lord. Well, you take the Ju Judaism system. Do they recognize Jesus as Lord? No, they have all kinds of names for him. He's a good teacher. He's Mary's son. He has many disciples. He was, Jesus was respected. He's a miracle worker. He claimed to be the Messiah. Any place there does it say that Jesus is Lord? How about Islam or Muslims? They recognize Jesus. He says he was born of a virgin. He's a prophet. He's a wise teacher. He's a miracle worker. Any place in there do you see him, recognize him as Lord? How about Hinduism? He's a holy man. He's a wise teacher. Jesus is God. They claim he's a God, but he is one of many gods. That's a little G that they claim Jesus to be. Buddhism. Jesus is an enlightened man. Jesus is a wise teacher. Jesus was a holy man. All of these things we see here. And the New Age movement puts Jesus as a wise moral teacher. All of them sound good. But do any of them claim Jesus as Lord? No, they don't. So from our scripture reading, we see four mistakes that we see in our scripture reading. The first one is his mistake about the person of Christ, thinking him only as a good teacher. Now, either he is God or he is not. We need to recognize that, don't we? You know, because we can read the Bible. It's got great lessons in it for all of us. And if you want to call him a teacher, then you really don't know him as Savior, do you? 
Number two, his mistake about the way to eternal life. What was his concept of the way to eternal life? Follow the commandments, wasn't it? Obey the laws. Do good works. Those were his concepts of what it was to get to eternal life. And what did he ask Jesus? He asked Jesus, what more can I possibly do? His mistake about himself thinking that he actually kept the law and never broke them. When you read through there, what does he say? He says, I never broke the law since my what? Youth. He doesn't count his childhood at all, does he? Now, do we count our childhood? When Christ say, God says that we sin, where does he start counting sin from? The day we were born, doesn't he? Yet, this guy didn't think that was counted in that picture. And the most important, he was not willing to heed the final words of Jesus. What did Jesus say in the last part of that? Come follow me. Now, was giving up all of his wealth Really a criteria of come and follow Jesus? It really wasn't. All it was is how committed are you to following me? And what we find out is that he's willing to follow the law, but he's not willing to be committed to Christ. Those are the four things we see in particular. In that scripture reading, we're reading mistakes. So today we ask ourselves the question is, God is just. And what does just mean? It says, God is perfectly just, which means he always gives people what they deserve. Now, there are some things you guys have done, you probably deserve the punishment you got. You know? But yet, that's just. When we go down the highway and we break the law of speeding and the officer pulls us over and we complain to him about, Lord, you know, officer, we had to speed. We had to get to that other spot on time. Does that count? No, he still gives you the speeding ticket, doesn't it? Because you broke the law. Number two, the Bible says those who are sinless deserve heaven and those who are sinners deserve hell. All right, who qualifies here as sinless? None of us do, do we? All people deserve hell since no person is sinless except Jesus. So we know what our qualifications and punishments are to begin with right off the bat. This is what Deuteronomy said about God. He says, He is the rock. His work is perfect. For all His ways are justice. A God of truth and without injustice, righteousness and upright is he. So, have you figured out what the definition of just is? Well, how about another word for it? We like to call it fair, don't we? Is it fair? Have you ever played games with your grandkids or your children? And they love to bend the rules because, after all, they're short. It's fair, isn't it? Even though the rule book says this is how you're supposed to go it, they liked it then. Have you ever run a race with them and how they think it's fair that they get two-thirds of the way to the line before you get to start? You know? But it's fair to them. In their mind, they think it's fair. So the question comes is, God is fair by whose standards? Is he fair by my standards? Is he fair by your standards? No, we have to look at the fact there's only one standard that God is fair by. And that's his standard, not ours. So, God is fair? Look across the United States. Have you ever looked across and seen what the speed limits are across the United States and what they used to be? You remember when we used to drive down the highway and it was 55? And then it was 65? And then it was 75? And then the government got involved into it and changed it back to 55 to stay alive? Remember those days? 
And then finally the government got out of it in 1995. They finally got out of it, gave it back to the states. And then the states decided, well, what's a fair speed limit for everybody? What's the interstate speed limit for Idaho? 80 miles an hour nowadays, you know? You get in parts of different countries, 65 over here. Up here, blue is 65. What's this? Gray is 70. Look at the different states. How many likes to go across Oregon? Nobody likes to go across Oregon, doesn't it? It feels like you're standing still. You've been on 80 for a while, and you hit Oregon, it's just like, ooh, stop. You know? I remember when at 55, it felt like you'd get out and walk faster than that car was moving. You know? And yet, Texas, what's the speed limit in Texas? 85 miles an hour. You see how we change the rules as time goes by? Some legislator gets together and decides, oh, well, we need to go faster. Or maybe next year they'll decide we need to go slower. But what's fair? Because I'll tell you what, when I go down the interstate at 80 miles an hour, cars are still passing me like I'm standing still. What's fair? Because I know if they were asked to, uh, to pass a vote on what the speed limit ought to be, there's going to be people who say 120 miles an hour ought to be the speed limit. You know? And every one of you guys will go 125. <laughs> Five miles over. Just guaranteed. Webster says fair is this. Agreeing with what is thought to be right or acceptable. Are treating people in a way that does not favor some others over others are not too harsh or critical. Isn't that what we call fair? You ever been someplace where they say, I'm sorry, you're not allowed. You don't have a ticket to get in. Well, that's not fair. You're being mean to me. That's harsh. Is that fair? Webster defines just as this, agreeing with what is considered morally right or good, treating people in a way that is considered morally right, reasonable or proper. Reasonable or proper. Are you trying to tell me that there's only one way to heaven is reasonable and proper? People don't think so, do they? You know? It, maybe you've heard of H.L. Mencken. He's an agnostic editor. He was formerly of the American Mercury. He died an unbeliever. At his funeral, following his request, there was neither song nor sermon. During his life, Mencken admitted he might be wrong in his views about God and the immortality of the soul. But, he explained, I love his answer. If I am wrong, I will square myself when confronted in afterlife by the apostles with the simple apology, gentlemen, I was wrong. What's his view of getting to heaven? I'll just apologize after I die. You think that's going to work? Well, he did apparently. Remember the story of the rich man and Lazarus? Remember the rich man all had all this stuff and wealth during his life? And Lazarus, who was the beggar, all he wanted was the crumbs off the rich man's table to just survive. Eventually, they both died. Remember the rich man? He goes down there. He looks across, and he sees Abraham over there. And he says, Abraham, go tell my family. Or maybe send Lazarus over here and just put a little drop of water on my lips. And Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted and you are tormented. And besides all this, between us, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. 
Does that sound like we get a second chance at eternal life? No, it doesn't. The here and now is the choice we have to make. It is not after we die. Remember Houdini who died when he did that thing and he says, you know, if I don't survive this one, I will come back and let you know what's on the other side. Did he ever come back and let us know? He's still trying probably. But you can see that there is no way back. The choice we make has to be made today, not tomorrow after we die. James A. A. Mc, Mc, or Divot, who orbit the Earth 62 times with Edward White aboard Gemini 4, I don't know if you remember this, said in a talk at the Foreign Press Club in Rome, he said, I did not see God looking into my space cabin window as I do not see God looking into my car's windshield on Earth. But I could recognize his work in the stars as well as when walking among flowers in a garden. If I can be with God on earth, you can be with God in space as well. See, he didn't need to have somebody put a big poster in front of him. He could see the work of God everywhere he went, even out in space. He could see the handiwork of God, and he was willing to recognize who the Creator was. Dwight D. Eisenhower said, It takes no brains to be an atheist. Any stupid person can deny the existence of a supernatural power because man's physical senses cannot detect it. But there cannot be ignored the influence of conscience, the respect we feel for moral law, the mystery of first life, or the marvelous order in which the universe moves about us on this earth. All these are evidences of the handiwork of the benefic benevolent deity. Shh, wow, what is that word now? Beneficent deity. For my part, that deity is the God of the Bible and Jesus Christ, his son. Even Eisenhower recognized it as a president. Now, Romans 6.23. Does everybody know what Romans 6.23 says? For the wages of sin is death, right? But the gift of God is eternal life in who? Absolutely. Now, does that say somebody else up there? Does it say good works? Does it say uh, he's a good teacher? Romans 5.8, but God demonstrated his low and love towards us in that while we are still sinners, Christ died for us. These are just simple facts. These are things that God says are just. Number three, God sent Jesus to take the punishment that we deserved for our sin. Matthew 25, 31 through 46. Does anybody remember the story of that? Is Jesus talking about separating the sheep from the goats? And then he talks about this is what happened and you were there for it. And they, they say, well, when was I there? And then he talks to the other group. This is what happened. But you weren't there for it. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him. He will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. Who's the sheep? We are. Who's the goats? The unbelievers are. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison or come to you? 
And the king will answer and say to them, Surely I say to you, Insomuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. All he asks us to do is present the gospel to others, doesn't he? And all we have to do it is in every situation. It doesn't matter where we're at. We can present the gospel to others. Then he will also say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not take me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they will also answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Surely I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And, the, they, and these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into everlasting life. Then those who do not, number four, those who not trust Christ will go to hell, but those who trust Christ will live in heaven forever. How simple and just is our God. He just tells us that there's one way to heaven, that's accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And yet, most of the world has a hard time accepting that one little statement. And then when they get there, they say, Lord, you can't, that's not fair. How could you say that's fair that we have to do this one little thing? But that's it. That's how simple it is. On it. God is just. He has foretold what is to happen. It says the book of Daniel, Isaiah, Ezekiel, and Revelation, just to name a few, tell us what life would be like prior to Christ's return. Today, we are the only generation to meet all the requirements of events leading to Christ's return. Do you understand in the last 10 years, the governments are thinking global. We're hearing more and more of a global system, and we ask ourselves why. In the last 10 years, over 1,000 doomsday seed vaults have been constructed. Governments are building massive underground bunkers and small underground cities for the leadership. Do you realize on July of 2012, we had a massive solar flare? That massive solar flare was so big, it actually went through the path of the earth as we circle. If it had happened one week earlier, that solar flare would have hit this earth. These are part of end times events that are happening that the Bible tells us about. And we don't even pay attention to them around us. The next one could very well hit the earth. Revelation talks about what is the next way the earth is going to be destroyed by? A third of the earth is going to be destroyed by what? Fire. And that's what a solar flare could very well do. John 3, 16 and 17. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have what? Everlasting life. That is just, guys. That's what God said. His rules do not change. He is fair. He is just. And verse 17, which we don't usually pay much attention to, it says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. We have a mission, folks. That is to tell the world about Jesus Christ. It may come at a cost. It may come at a price. But we need to tell them because we are in the season of the end times. And we need to know that our friends and neighbors and families will be in heaven with us also. And that excuse that guy used that I'll do it after I die, it ain't going to work. 
Father, we just want to thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that you have, from the very beginning of time, established your rules and justice. You've told us what you want us to do. You've given us the opportunity throughout our whole life to accept your son, Lord. Lord, we pray that each of us has put you into our heart. We thank you for that, Lord. We thank you, Lord, to know that our life is secure, that we will spend an eternity in heaven with you. So when people say it isn't fair, ask them what fair is. Who sets the rules to what's fair? The Creator sets the rules. The one who's holy sets the rules. Let us be faithful, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Our last song, It Is Well With My...